As way of introduction, let me tell you that I am not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a researcher. What I do is movement education. I've been involved in martial arts for a lot of years, really interested in the history of the human body. I've been to Africa a few times, and I, I write books. So what, what I've done over the last couple of decades is try to gather up all my understanding of the history of the human body into one sort of unified view. And recently what I discovered was this phrase called the long body. And this comes from the Native American tradition, but it's very obscure. If you were to Google this, you would find hardly any hits. I think it comes from the Iroquois tradition. And what I've decided to do is run with this idea and see how far I can go with it. And I would like to road test it with you today. So this is the long body. And by way of background, of course, we need to talk about our problems of trying to adapt in the modern world. And this is familiar old news to most of us, the fact that our bodies came from this old place. Our bodies are ancient. Our bodies are aboriginal. We are all African. Every detail of our anatomy, our physiology, our social behavior is all ancient. And now we're trying to live in this new place, what a lot of people call the alien environment. And of course, as we just heard, it's a question of mismatch. And this is something that it's a it's a new scientific concept, but it's also something that we feel personally. A lot of us feel maladapted to the modern world, and it's not, just, uh, it's not just us, it's a real thing. And the consequences are severe, obviously. We've gone from this to this in the blink of an eye. Now, a lot of us will pin the blame on agriculture, and we'll say that the the tipping point was 10,000 years ago, this transition from pre-agriculture to an agricultural way of life destroyed our bodies. We've gone from resilient, vigorous hunter-gatherers to whatever it is here on the right. But I think this has happened much more recently. This, maybe the last 100 years, this is a 20th century thing. And throughout the 20th century, all of these afflictions are on the rise, all of these conditions, all of these problems with our bodies, and not just our bodies, but these are psychophysical. These are problems of our psychology, problems of our spirit, and all of these things are on the rise. But when we're going to talk about the body, we have to choose the right lens. When we're going to talk about anything, any photographer will tell you, you have to choose the right lens. And I'm going to propose to you that we have chosen the wrong lens in a lot of circumstances to look at the body. I think we're afflicted with a bit of myopia. Now, this is an actual real thing. Okay, there, there is an epidemic now of myopia. There, Journal Nature ran a piece here a couple of years ago on this. But it's not just literal myopia, it's the idea of myopia, this, this figurative myopia where we're zooming in, getting closer and closer to the body all the time, getting closer and closer to the object of our study. And in effect, this is what we do. We use lenses, we use instruments, and we use whole disciplines to zoom in on the body as an object. And we get closer and closer. And this is what I see. We use um, biochemistry, biomechanics, anatomy, physiology. No, no matter what health discipline you're involved in, you usually start with anatomy, right? Here are the muscles. Zoom in on the body, get closer and closer. And this is valuable information. This is good knowledge to be gained from this type of approach. But it also makes us go blind to some other things, especially the life-supporting relationships that exist outside us. And this is why I'm an advocate for zooming out. Oh, by the way, this is something that we see in our culture and our depictions of the human body. This is any newsstand pretty much anywhere in the world. Have you noticed this? 
are depictions of the body with no background. We zoom in. We look at the body as an object. And in every case, it holds. Upper, upper left here, obviously bodybuilders do this. They eliminate any background to make the body appear as an isolated individual unit that stands alone and apart from any other context, any other setting, any other life support system. And you would expect bodybuilders to do this, right? But even Golf Digest does it, right? And men's health, men's health, you never see a background. You never see a context. You never see a life supporting system for the body. So this is what I call the short body. And this is our cultural view of the body now. We look at bodies in isolation. And the problem that comes from this short body orientation is that we start to lose sight of the things that actually keep us alive. And I know a lot of you guys are trainers, coaches, teachers, working with people in their bodies. This is one of the fundamental questions. What is it that keeps us alive? Because it's not really diet and exercise. It's more like habitat keeps us alive and our tribe keeps us alive as well. So as, a, as an antidote to this short body orientation, I'm proposing a long body point of view. And when I use this phrase, the long body, I simply mean the short, the isolated body plus its life supporting systems of habitat and tribe. So when I say the long body, I'm talking about the totality of that system. And it's a nice way to look at bodies as bigger than they appear. This meme, by the way, is very disruptive. It's very inconvenient and it's very challenging because if you adopt this meme, if you adopt this idea, it challenges us to redraw a lot of boundaries in modern culture and to rearrange a lot of our thinking about the body and about health but it's also a very positive and life-affirming idea. Now, when I've, I've shopped this idea around to some people, they say, well, Frank, is this just a metaphor? I say, well, yeah, it, it is a metaphor, but it's not just a metaphor. Even if it was just a metaphor, it would be a powerful one. We can use these terms short and long to talk about all kinds of features in our world in our human experience. We can talk about short and long cultures, short and long attention spans, short and long commerce or relationships. Whatever it is, it's an incredibly powerful metaphor. Is it a native indigenous view? Yes. In fact, this idea of interdependence is probably, from, from my reckoning, this is probably one of the oldest ideas in the world. Every ancestral culture that we've studied makes note of this. It's bedrock. Is it scientifically valid? Yes, we have a mountain of research that points to the interdependence, the continuities between our bodies and habitat, our bodies and tribe. Is it a path to personal health? Yes, but in a paradoxical way. You take care of your short body first and then start paying attention to your long body, the bigger than self orientation, that's also a way to maximize your health. And is it a spiritual path? Yes, because it breaks down the distinction between self and other. And every religious spiritual tradition that we know of has taken a similar step. So I'll let you read this. Where is the me? Where does the me begin? Where does the other begin? And the cartoon answer, the Western civilization answer, is that, well, the me stops right here. The outermost layer of my skin, that is me, and everything outside of that is other. And that's the distinction that we, as Western-educated people, tend to make. But 
that is not the norm in human history. Most ancestral people had a bigger view of me, a bigger view of who they were, a longer view. Here's a long body idea, an ancient long body idea. So again, interdependence being one of the oldest human ideas. The people are sick, I too am sick. There's a tendency in our modern culture to create health islands. Whether they're communities or individuals, we think of them as health islands. They're separate from disease that's around them. But this older, long body view says, no, you can't do that. You can't create these health islands. It doesn't work relationship to habitat. This is a classic long body view. The environment is not something else. The environment is not out there. And these, these are people who didn't even know about the microbiome. They don't know about biology. They don't know about, um, they don't know what we know. And it's not just native people. Alan Watts, a famous Zen philosopher, touched on the same idea. I'll let you read this. External organs. What an interesting idea to look at habitat as external organs. Now again, a skeptic would say, well, that's just metaphor. He's being poetic. And even if that's true, poetry is powerful, metaphor is powerful. But we could look at this as a literal truth. And we could look at these things differently. So these are not just pretty pictures to put on your wall in your office. No, these are actual organs of your body. They just happen to be big and over there. But they contribute to your health. They are part of us. We are part of them. And even the microbiome, some people are calling this a bacterial organ. And the, the superficial idea is that, well, the microbiome is inside me. But if your body is a tube, which it is, then the microbiome is another external organ. It's also outside us. I'll let you read this. So from the standpoint of DNA, we are more microbial than human. So who's driving the bus? What, what is I? What is me? How, what is the extent of my body? How long is my body? We are so used to thinking about the microbiome now and trying to solve this, this microbial puzzle as a way to improve our own personal health. But the bigger message here, I think, is that it forces us to think, well, maybe I'm not the most important thing around. You know, maybe, maybe there's more to this story. Pronoun I becoming obsolete. You know, if you're really serious about biology, you're starting to see, wow, maybe I'm not an autonomous individual. And maybe my sense of self is kind of an illusion, which is what the Buddhists have been saying all along. So this is, a this is very much a long body idea. Now, another long idea here is the importance of context, the importance of setting, the importance of environment. Bruce Alexander, when he was a young researcher, he looked at the studies that were being done on addiction, specifically with uh, high, the so-called highly addictive substances like cocaine. And the classic way to study this was to take a rat in a cage and see how much cocaine that rat would consume and they would, of course, become addicted. And Bruce Alexander came along and said, well, there's, there's something really wrong with this picture because you're, you're studying these animals who live in an alien environment. So why don't we give them a normal environment 
and see how they live. And that's what he did. He built what is called the Rat Park. And this was basically a utopia for rats. And it had all the features that normal rat populations would, would love. And then he would introduce these so-called addictive substances. And the rates of addiction were far, far lower. And so throughout his career now, he's emphasized the importance of setting and context and environment. So when you get serious about this long body idea, you start to understand that everything that we do is reflective. Everything that we do to the so-called external world, everything that we do to the so-called outside world is actually mirrored back onto us. And again, this is an old idea. Chief Seattle's famous speech, this is classic Native American stuff, but it's also classic indigenous thinking. You hear this same idea reflected from Australia to Africa to North America. It's all over the paleo world. To wound the earth is to wound yourself. And when we destroy habitat, that is just like cutting off a limb. And it, be, it comes as no surprise to see what's happened to indigenous people when they are displaced from their land. Because their sense of identity with the land is so complete. I'll let you read this one, too. The earth hurts and we hurt with it. Theodore Rozak is an eco-psychologist. And again, the same rap could be said here. Oh, this is just poetry, this is just metaphor. But I think there's a real, I think you can draw a very straight line from biospheric catastrophe to personal health. And it goes like this, when you feel your habitat being destroyed, when you feel your habitat under stress, and, you, and you, can, you can read about it or you can actually feel it, you feel stress too. And now your thresholds for disease and injury and illness begin to drop. Your sense of power and control is diminished. And so that has a very real biochemical effect on your body. And I can be certain that a lot of office visits in modern medicine are due to this kind of thing. The other implication here is that environmental activism is a form of health care. And this is something that mystifies me to no end because what we do, we pigeonhole a lot of our behaviors now and we say that some people over here at this end of campus or this end of town are doing environmental habitat preservation. These are the nonprofits, and they're, they're doing good work in environmentalism. And over here at the other end of campus are the people who are working on health. Well, why don't we put those two groups together? I, I just don't understand. The, the, this should be a really tight alliance, and it's not. So we talked about habitat, let's talk about tribe, let's talk about people. This is a shot, I, I went to Africa and spent a little bit of time with the Hadza Bushmen. And the thing to remember about our social nature is that it's not just something that we enjoy. It's, not just, we, it's more than just wanting to affiliate with other people. It's deep in our bodies. Our bodies are constructed to be social. And this is our social experience. Every day, unconscious, all the time. We're always measuring and trying to evaluate, are we in or out? And this is the question that we always ask. You know, did I get the job or was I rejected? Did I get invited to the party or not? What is it? We're always asking this question because this is the question that kept us alive on the grassland. Now, this is, this is interesting, but it also has huge health consequences, as you see. The brain is a social organ. Cozzolino wrote this book, which is fascinating, about 
social neuroscience, or what some people call interpersonal neurobiology. The brain is a social organ, that sounds right, but he goes so far as to say there are no single human brains. In other words, we are so radically social, so massively connected with one another, that it doesn't even make sense to dissect out a single human brain, because they don't work that way. Why would you study them that way? We need other brains, we need conferences like this to function our best. And the flip side here, we know very well that solitary confinement is a form of torture. Our brains don't work very well there. Dan Siegel um, out of UCLA talks about the resonance circuit, and this is a a circuit that, this is a long body circuit. This is a transpersonal circuit. So when I look at your bodies and your facial expressions and your postures, my mirror neurons fire and it goes to my limbic system and then down the vagus nerve into my gut and then back up to my prefrontal cortex, which modifies my behavior. And now I'm including your body into this resonance circuit. And of course, this, this is the fundamental unit of social interaction. And we sabotage this like crazy with all our devices. This is not communication because we've, we've eliminated the resonance circuit. Bad news. We also know that behavior is intensely, um, it flows through social groups. And we could track this, people who measure the rise and falling of, of social behavior. It makes sense to know that your friends can influence your behavior. If one of your friends starts smoking or stops smoking or whatever they do, it can influence your behavior, obviously. But your friend's friends will also influence your behavior. Even though you don't see these people very often, but if they change their behavior, it's more likely you will too. But it's even more than that. Your friend's friend's friends can also influence your behavior, and you never see these people. If they change their behavior, there's a chance you will too. We are that sensitive. Being part of the tribe or not makes our bodies more or less resilient. And this study was great. They looked at synchronous dancing versus asynchronous dancing. If you're dancing in part of a group, you feel part of that group, and then they measure your pain tolerance, your pain tolerance is higher. In other words, your resilience is higher because you feel part of that totality. You are more powerful because of it. And this all comes together with Michael Marmot. This is one of the most inconvenient ideas out there right now. What Marmot did was studied epide epidemiological studies around the world, and there was a real consistency there. If you are of high rank, regardless of your culture, if you are of high rank, you're much more likely to be healthy than if you're of low rank. And this, they, they factored out all the things that might be obvious here. It's not just the case that rich people can go to the doctor or that rich people can go to the gym, or that rich people can buy better food. It's not that. It's, there's something fundamental about being of high rank that contributes to health, or vice versa. And it's probably stress, right? It's probably the sensation, the feeling, the perception of being in-group or out-group. This doesn't get nearly the play that it needs to get because our social experience is fundamental to our health, and we don't talk about this nearly enough. It even goes down to uh, the level of neurotransmitter receptors in your brain. If you're of higher rank, you're more um, capable of feeling pleasure, for example, and even myelin production. If you are socially isolated, you have less of this insulating wrapping around your axons, so the circuits don't function as effectively. Unbelievable. Now, some of you will, will be tracking this. Sebastian Younger basically gives us a long body perspective. He doesn't use that phrase, but it's very clear what he's talking about here is that his particular example, people go to war, they feel a really strong sense of tribe, community, bonding, physical 
psychological power that comes with that, and then they come back home, their tribe is gone, and now they suffer from PTSD. So it, it's an, an amazing long body approach. Versus, you know, Ubuntu. If you haven't heard this word, this is great. This is an African philosophy of social identity. Thanks. And basically, it just says that I am not just a short body. I am not an individual. I am who I am because of who we are. We are people through other people. So this is, again, a very old idea of the long body. Long body medicine, this is a whole subject that we could really get into. Um, I'll let you read that. Big pictures. A lot of people say, well, I'm holistic. I'm really taking in the big picture. And this is, you hear this all over the place. I went to massage school a few years ago. Everybody said, I'm a holistic practitioner because I do mind, body, spirit. But from what we've seen so far, this is not holistic, right? There's a lot of things missing here. George Engel said, well, we, it can't just be biological. It has to be psycho and social. That was an improvement. But really, the holistic model mind, body, spirit, you have to include land, tribe, and ancestors. And this is a paleo model. If you read aboriginal writing, um, interviews with aboriginal people, this comes up over and over again. They will not talk to you without talking about land and tribe and, and ancestry. And this leads us to is some solutions here. The people who are doing really good work come from a surprising place here, and that's the veterinarians. The vet, their scope of practice is this big. You know, the doctors, their scope of practice is this big, right? The veterinarians are getting together and saying, we need a one health perspective. In other words, we need a long body perspective. Let's look at the animals, the non-human animals, and the human animals, and habitat all together. And this is their their way to illustrate this one umbrella, public health, personal health, habitat health, all together in the same framework. Um, it's showing up in more and more places, One Health Alliances, and One Health Day coming up in November, One Medicine Symposium, this is the same idea, putting it all together holistically, long body prescriptions, Start with the short body, sure. I'm not suggesting that we throw out our short body medicine. All of this stuff is worthwhile. Spend, ask your doctor if going outdoors is right for you. Get to learn your habitat, right? More face-to-face -face contact. That's how we work best. Start giving your health away. Health is achievable. We, you know, for most people, we can figure out the formula and we can get healthier. And then what's the next step? Start giving it away. Giving it away to habitat, giving it away to social causes to encourage the health of the long body and tell a new story. This is why I'm trying to get this long body meme out into the world, start getting it into conversation, getting it into story, because when we do that, we're going to shift human perceptions of, of who we are. So that's the meme. I've got an event coming up in October if you're interested. This is going to be a whole lot of fun and it'll be a long body training essentially. Lots of movement, some talks, the whole thing. It'll be really fun. So that's my wrap on the long body. Thank you so much.